once I'm done getting my 240 months of payments of that monthly payment, right? That uh, 779.42, that loan goes back for, goes from me back to you, the seller, and you still get to collect the remaining 105 payments, which at that time when we send it back to you, the balance of the note is $63,000. Yeah. So you're still going to collect another $63,000 plus interest for the 105 payments moving forward, which that's awesome, right? And I got my yield, you got your some money out of it, and you can move forward to it. Um, so if this was something that you were holding in your IRA, this is a perfect yeah. uh, strategy because then you've got that, you've got income, whatever it is, 10 years from now, five years from now, 15 years from now, whatever it is. Uh, plus a lump sum today. So a lump sum today, after some time goes by, once that partial is completed, you still get that income back. Hey everyone, Dave Putz here from JKP Holdings. Alongside me, as always, Mr. Nathan Turner. How are Hello. you? Doing well, doing well. Awesome, man. It's been another week going back to back weeks here. It's been a, a fun fall. How are things with you? I saw some pictures of you uh, doing a little bit of traveling with your son. <laughs> yes, I'm I'm finally doing what you asked and what you told me to do for a couple of years now, getting a little more active on social media. So that's an example. Yeah, I was able to go and uh, take off for a few days with my son uh, for a camping trip that he's got. He's, he got into this program where he gets to do all this outdoor learning stuff, which is so, so, so cool. And so I'm happy to be able to volunteer that's and awesome. to have a business where I can do that. That's, that's been awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> so you, good point. You said there, right? you're doing something you can do anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world and kind of have things set up in systems. Um, but what we're finding is a lot of people who are uh, on the other side of this space of doing seller finance and, owner finance and creative finance, all this kind of world, it's a little bit different for them, right? Because they're doing marketing and they're doing all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. And we get all that, but we want to be the bang for a lot of these people. And a lot of people don't know about us. Right. Um, so we wanted to dive more into it. And this year, if you're new to us, this will be on YouTube, our podcast, everything else. We focus this year truly on connecting note buyers with originators, seller finance, all kinds of different way of buy, creating notes. Yeah. It's what is your been, and Yeah. What's your been I, experience, your thoughts? You know, it's been interesting. And we've been talking about this all year. Um, just yesterday, I had two different phone calls with two different people that talked about how uh, they're originating some fairly large numbers. One guy's talking about 30 to 40 a month. Um, where they're just, they're originating just a bunch of notes and they want to sell them. So, I mean, they, it's out there. People are looking to sell this stuff. Uh, and they're, and most of the people that I've talked to, they're willing to tailor make it uh, yeah. to what we're looking for, which is perfect. That's exactly yep. what we're looking for. So there, there's tons out there. I think we're going to see more and more of that as interest rise can interest rates continue to stay high Yep. maybe rise, uh, but I think we're going to see more and more seller finance come out. Yeah, over time. absolutely. And I think for us, you know, we want to educate them, but also learn from them as well. Yeah. So it's a two way street. So we can kind of really grasp what you guys are doing so we can tell our business, but also help you tell your business to unload, recoup, cash out, whatever word you want to use and get mm -hmm. some of that money back out. Um, so for that feature, I think, working together as a team is going to be our biggest um, asset moving forward. Yeah, um, definitely. So one of the things we've learned in the past year, uh, which has been really interesting, this idea of what is a correct note on your world? Because remember, we bought bank notes, everyone, yeah. for years, and we never yeah. worried about any of that kind of stuff. So we wanted to make sure that we understand what is to create a new note? And we've connected with some of the best experts in the space who are creating and basically running teams of, of creations of notes, wraps, subject twos, seller finance, creative finance, and getting a good understanding of what you guys do. 
Um, so it's awesome. So I, please, I encourage you guys to share our content with those people in that space. Yeah, definitely. Seller Finance, I think we've estimated $32 billion was created last year. It's Holy a huge God. industry. Yeah. And and there's no slowing down. Like I say, I, I think we're going to see more and more of that coming out. Yes. Uh, it's tough to get a loan in a bank. And if you're not able to, seller financing is a really great way to go. Not to say you're a bad borrower, not to say that uh, there's something wrong with with those kinds of borrowers that get seller finance. It's just, it's another option. Yeah. Um, and speaking as a self-employed person, man, it's so much easier to deal with a person than it is to deal with the bank a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys are out there, please keep in touch with us. For you note buyers, I'm hoping that the information we've given you has been useful for you, right? Um, and if if it hasn't or something else you want to hit on, let us know. So one of the reasons we've been asking is why are we shifting from the bank to the seller finance world? And you hit on one thing, dealing with a hedge fund or bank is not as negotiable a lot of times as right. the seller finance. Yeah. But the other feature is the fact that these loans are created at 10, 11, 12% where we're just having a trouble getting those loans from a bank because last three, five years have been really low interest rates. Yeah. And, and we're always buying our main goal of note investing is yield. So yep. we're, we're always just going after yield. So if we've got a note written at three or 4%, the discount that we have to work in there is huge. Yes. And so it makes it really difficult to get a deal done. So when we see these notes being written at nine, 10, 11%, uh, that's much easier for us to, to get a deal done. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that we, we want to make sure we understand you guys, right? So when you have a question, let us know as a note buyer, right? We're trying to work on how to buy wraps and stuff like that. It's been a little bit more challenging. Um, but one of the key features that most people don't get is when you're creating these loans, and I don't know why it's not taught as much as it should be, the creation of the note is just as important as the details inside the note. Absolutely. That when you guys are creating these notes and these borrowers are owner occupants, meaning they bought the property, they bought the property, they're going to live in it and they took a loan out on it. Mm -hmm. We've run into too many people out there who are teaching or learning that these seller finance paper needs to be passing the Dodd-Frank laws and passing all the regulations that was put forth back in 2006, 7, 8, that changed the industry and said, listen, no longer can we have this happen. And we want to make sure that you guys get that because if you don't, you're going to have problems long moving forward. Mm -hmm. And what people I don't think are getting is that the last three, four years, portfolios are all performing. When right. things are good, there's no problems. Yeah. It's when they go bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's only a problem until it's, a, it's not a problem until it's a problem. But then when it's a problem, it's a big problem. Yes. And if you haven't done it right up front, uh, you're going to run into some really difficult challenges yep. going forward, uh, which could cost you a lot of money, uh, a lot of heartache. And so yeah. do it right up front. Uh, and there are ways to do that. And so yeah. that's part yeah. of who we got on today is yeah. talking about let's that. Bring him, let's bring Mark on, Mark. <clears throat> uh, man, it is a pleasure to have you on with us. I think that the information you've shared with us just in the recent couple of months has been amazing. Yeah. Well, thanks. Um, Appreciate yeah. that, uh, David and, and Nate. It's it's a pleasure to be here and to address your audience. It's always good to be among like-minded people. And yes. um, we we all have the same kind of uh, approach to things. Uh, yeah. I was always the loner out there in most of my <laughs> career. And it's nice to see there's others uh, that kind of have the same mindset that I do. Yeah. So let's back up here a second. We got to do some Mark. Um, we do a private call on Wednesdays with a, a bunch of really smart people. And Mark came on the set like a, a bull out of shoot because he really said to us, guys, I've been doing this for a long time. The knowledge, the experience, the, and the wealth of information. And we may not always agree on certain situations, but you bring the facts up and say, this is what the law states. And you play by the law. And that's extremely useful. So, Mark, how did you get introduced to this? What do you guys do currently? And how many states are you doing it in? So, uh, 
again, thank you for having me. The uh, my my background actually is primarily in the private money or hard money arena. I, I cut my teeth back actually in the seventies. That's when I started in this in this field. So I'm an old old fart from that perspective. Um, and the uh, the first ten years of my career, all I did was hard money lending. I didn't know what an FHA or VA or conventional loan was. I wow. just cut my teeth on on the private money and worked in that arena and then expanded um, a number of years later into the more traditional market. So we just kind of added that component to our business and started my own company in 86 and ran it for over 25 years before I merged it into my current to my current operation. So it, it's been something that I've been working on for a long time. It's basically my career and um, my passion is more on the private money or hard money side of things. And after Dodd-Frank uh, came out in, in effective 2010, uh, that's when things really started to change. After the housing crisis in 08, uh, rules started to come out and everything changed as of 2010. And one of the things that I noticed was that uh, I figured that the Dodd-Frank Act was the, I, I kind of call it the Loan Originator Employment Act, because it gave us, us loan originators an opportunity to participate in this, in this world, in the seller carryback world, because Dodd-Frank requires uh, to hire loan originators in a number of cases. So um, we started to play in that arena and it just have expanded it. Uh, we do RMLOs, which is the Residential Mortgage Loan Originator Program. Uh, in uh, across the country. We just do the Dodd-Frank compliance piece. We don't necessarily do the state compliance piece. Different states have different requirements. Some have no requirements. I'm in Arizona. We have no requirements on seller carryback. You go to Texas, there's lots of requirements. So it just depends on what state you're in. But uh, we do the, the Dodd-Frank piece of the piece of the puzzle. Uh, and keep you keep your nose clean when it comes to compliance there. So that's where we play uh, in one sector of our business operation is the RMLO uh, the, process. It's funny you say that, Mark. So I was I was originating notes in Columbus, Ohio, 2010, 2011, 2012. And then when the rules, was it 2012 or 13 that Dodd-Frank became, kind of came well, actually, into law? Actually, it's 2010. It was. <laughs> but then 2014 is when all of the remaining provisions came. <clears throat> gotcha. That's what it was. So I had, I had heard about it. I'd learned a little bit about it. Um, and and we were looking around for an RMLO and could not find anybody. Like just, they didn't seem to exist. We I'd go and talk to like a mortgage broker or something like that. I'd say, so, you know, I'm looking for somebody that can help me navigate Dodd-Frank. And they're like, Dodd who? Like, they had no idea what we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, knowing that this was a rule uh, and that it was going to be, you know, all the uh, uh, kind of fines and everything attached to it, yeah. it was an important enough thing. We eventually shut that down. I stopped originating because I knew that this was going to be a challenge and I couldn't find an Armolo. So we're glad to have you here. Yeah. This is an RMLO. This is somebody this is who can help you. Nationwide you too, which is yeah. unbelievable that's a, having that's you That's a big deal. What is, in a quick summary, if someone says screw it and they create 50, 60, 20 loans without an RMLO, what's the consequence? So, you know, I don't know what the fines and penalties are because I've never played in that arena, thankfully. Mm. I, I haven't had to deal with that. Uh, I just know that um, the Dodd-Frank has teeth and it can make someone's life pretty yeah. unbearable. Um, so fines and obviously cease and desist and all sorts of different things. Is mm -hmm. If you don't have, uh, the thing that people don't realize is that seller carrybacks generally are created between a buyer and a seller. Simply somebody has a house, they want to sell it and they want to be the bank for the buyer. Right. And, and you would see, you would think that that was a simple capitalistic kind of activity, but Dodd Frank comes in, steps into the way, and says, "No, that's not the way you you can do it." And I, I personally think that the act is misplaced. I I really don't see any reason for it, nor do I see any reason for my activities. Honestly, you don't need me 
for sure. you know, if Dr. Frank wasn't there, you wouldn't need me. But right. because it's there, there's th this sense that you got to play by the play by the rules. Yeah. And, um, and you and don't want to be known as the lender who doesn't do it right. Attorneys will jump all over that. You know, right. your borrowers will talk to their attorney something when something goes to fault and things start changing. All this stuff's going to start twinkling down and that attorney is going to, with their teeth, is going to go after that lender and hit every loan that you guys own. So be yeah. sure you get talking with Mark about what you're doing and what states you're in and stuff like that. So yeah. Mark, I, we've run across a lot of these owner finance people who, oddly enough, never heard of actually selling their note. Let's get back. To, is it legal to sell a note? Absolutely. A, a note is a negotiable instrument, just like a stock or a bond is. And so it can can be marketed and sold in the same vein that any other type of financial instrument can be sold. The beauty of it is, is that it's generally done on the private side of the market. I mean, it's between you and me. Uh, it's not sold on Wall Street, although you can find companies that have hundreds of notes for sale at a, any given time. But generally, it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one type of situation. So somebody sells sure. a piece of property, carries it back, they're happy with the terms, and then something in their life changes, and they need some cash, and this note is something that they can utilize to, to achieve some cash. Yes. And we last week talked about some of the advanced strategies of no partials, which tricked us, uh, triggered us to talk to you about are seller finance people familiar with this idea of selling a partial of their payments and and it seemed to us that they're not super familiar with it and they're kind of uncertain about it. And then we ran the numbers with you, it kind of questioned why they don't know more about it because the money they can make in a quick kind of cup of it, the money, and then hold the back end seems to be a win-win for them as well as for us. Right. We've seen a lot of that. In fact, I teach a class at one of the local real estate schools a continuing ed class. And one of the things we go over is just this particular topic, why a note has value, uh, how it can be sold, how it can be structured, and some of the ways to move through it to get some money. And actually, when you sell a partial, you actually can make more money than you would by getting paid off in full. So it, it really is a win-win a, a for everybody involved in a transaction like this. So let's get it back. For those who didn't join us last week, definitely uh, check out the podcast or the YouTube channel or whatever. Can you break down what a partial is? What does that mean? So I actually have an example, David, that I can I can share if I might. Yeah. Let's uh, go that... over the definition and we're going to break okay. it down. We're going to share a screen. But what is overall, what is a partial? I mean, are we, are we am I buying five hours of next week's payment or what's it look like overall? Well, the beauty of it is that you can structure a partial sale any way you want. So uh, we've done transactions where we've sold, obviously, the whole note. Somebody says, I have this note. I want to sell it. I want to be cashed out. I'm done. So that's the full or the entire note sale strategy. But then beyond that, there's this partial note. So we can sell a portion of that note. We can sell a portion of the payment. We can sell a portion of the balance. We can sell any kind of piece of it that we want. The beauty of it is, is that there's no structure or uh, absolute formula that you have to follow. It's just basically what buyer and seller agree to is what can be sold. And that's what I like about this industry in general is that it's there's no um, absolute rules that I have to follow. I can say, yeah, right. I want to sell, you know, five years worth of payments. Okay, then let's figure out what five years worth of payments look like. And let me. And I'm going to jump in here just to, so those who don't know who me and Nathan are, you know, we've been buying notes since 2010 and previous. And buying these notes has been a real attractive thing. And this partial world was kind of a, a mysterious world for us for a long time because not a lot of people were selling it. I think it's because po most people didn't understand it. But it's a great scenario for us and also people who may not have a lot of money that may only have 10, 15, 20,000. They just want to get their money working. IRA money is key, right? And the documentation of the contract can be written any way we want. And I would definitely tune into last week's video to see some of the intricacies of that. But we can, if someone has 
six grand in the Roth IRA, you can buy six months of payments, mm -hmm. right? So, Mark, what what do you think owner finance people understand when it comes to selling a note or selling a partial? Where is their understanding stop? I would say or well, I, I just think that there's not a good educational component to this side of the world. You know, the, um, you know, I, I mentioned I teach a little bit of it. I teach 45 minutes of a three hour course. So it's not like you're going to get a lot of education uh, in in something like this. There's just a, a lack of quality information. And you guys with your YouTube channels and things of that nature are spreading the word. And that's what really needs to be done is to let people know that there are opportunities out there beyond the simple transactions that you may have heard about in the past. So for me, I've been doing it a long time, but I do it in a pretty very small world. Uh, and that's where I think by opening it up, you know, like social media has given us more opportunities to make things known and mm -hmm. Certainly, it's a great tool that you guys are doing to put that information out. Yeah, that's we're awesome. trying. We're trying to educate the masses here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it it's tough. And the more people that know about it, the more stability that industry will have. The more product that industry will have. Yep. It's just Absolutely. it's just going to grow and grow with with that educational component. And even just conformity, like we're like, that's been a big focus. We're trying to get people on board using an RMLO. Uh, like you say. Do you need to exist? Uh, that's debatable, but the rules are there. So yes, let's just follow the rules and and get it done properly so that there's it just solves problems in the long run. Yeah, and I would encourage you guys. We are, we'll chime in here for a second. Um, coming next year in 2024, May June, um, Nathan runs the Diversified Mortgage Expo down in Nashville. So if any of you guys are in the seller finance world, stop for me for Nathan, right? Come down, take a look at it, and talk um, to us in person. Just we're chat. putting together, yeah, we're putting together the schedule and everything this week, uh, and it's coming together really nicely. It looks we've got, <clears throat> I think, three different sessions having to do with wow. seller finance. So it's uh, That's awesome. Come and join. It's going to be yeah. really, really educational. You'll see. You'll see. Yeah. So let's dive into some numbers here, Mark. I think people, you know, and feel free in the <clears throat> chat, guys. Feel free to have questions, curiosities understanding and stuff like that anything we kind of not sure we're doing right please feel free to jump in there I do, excuse me i see cindy made a comment that we're doing it right the right way the first time is called integrity yes Cindy, i appreciate it yeah absolutely it's key for anyone you need to understand because us note buyers need to learn the stuff note sellers need to learn this stuff and us note buyers understand it it's a different world you guys used to find the property get the borrower and put them in place but we want to make sure you understand this side of it so that if you need to recoup some of that money and get us going we can do that as well so um absolutely so yeah so one thing came up was that uh randy mentioned that he's planning on creating a wrapped and selling note as a partial just before we get to the partial numbers just be understanding the fact that wrap notes are a little bit difficult for partials, the reason being is you have the underlying borrower, um, unless that underlying borrower is you or someone you know, and not an actual uh, home owner that you moved out and you have an underlying first, the intricacies of getting that borrower to sign over a POA to this partial buyer can get a little bit cumbersome. Um, so Randy, feel free to reach out to us with some curiosities. Um, it just makes it a little bit more difficult, but, um, if we can come up with an idea, Nathan and I will uh, definitely entertain it because I know rap notes are huge. So yeah, yeah, um, very interested in that. Let's let's um, yeah. So it's awesome. Yeah, I guess Heidi. Yes, the same thing with Heidi. We're just trying to um, work out that thing. If we can pay off that first with our partial purchase, we have no problem doing it. Um, it just makes it a little bit more difficult, right? So. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll let Nathan kind of respond to that. And uh, yeah, we can talk some more for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what's what's trans or Mark, I'm gonna let you go ahead and share your screen. Hopefully, as we'll uh, go successfully here and uh, see what you got to show us. We're gonna go over some numbers and partials and see why it's uh, attractive uh, for us for to, the seller as well. for mm -hmm. a seller to buy it. And why is it attractive, right? 
So this is an example I've put together. Um, this is actually a real transaction that uh, occurred some time ago, but it kind of gives you a sense of what we're dealing with. So in this particular case, there was a sale of $180,000, buyer put 50 down, carry back was 130, 30 year term. It was written at 6% interest rate. This is the current balance 127 and the payment is 779 and there's 345 months remaining. So if somebody held that note, they would be they would be saying, you know, I need some cash. I've got this note. What can I do to, to generate some cash? The normal strategy would be to sell the entire note. And this portion here in TAN kind of gives you that idea. So they're selling 345 payments. We would give them $81,000 for that. That would yield us 10.303%. So that 6% note now yields me 10%. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to carry it for two, 345 months, and I'm going to give the seller a net of eighty one thousand dollars. Wow! Uh, so that means that there's a, almost a forty seven thousand dollar discount here. So if I had a yield requirement of ten percent on my paper, in order to do that, I'm going to I'm going to have to discount that forty seven thousand dollars, which is a huge amount of money, and people aren't going to like that. No, nope. uh, and that's a thirty six percent discount. And Dave and I probably wouldn't even pay that much. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, understand that right now, right? So we're going to have a discount so much. And this is one of the creativity. You'd make sure that interest rate is high as possible. Yeah. But not every situation can have a higher interest rate because the borrower may not have the ability to repay, right? That's one of the key features. So in this situation, we're going to have to give you a lot less money than you would normally get if we bought the whole loan, right? It may not work out. Doesn't make it a bad deal. Just make the numbers don't work. Now, if this was a 12% interest rate, it may work out better, but you're still going to have to get a discount. And you may not like that, or it may not be enough money to do what you want to do with it. Right. And so what we did was we expanded the concept and we've now created a partial note sale strategy. And these next three columns uh, are showing what it would look like if you sold a partial. So these are just three examples of selling a partial. At option number one, we sell, the, the holder of the paper sells 240 months. Instead of the 345, he sells 20 years of payments. We're going to give him 73.5 for that note, almost as much as we would give him for the whole note, as you can mm. see, it's pretty close there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of 240 months, the balance remaining on the note is 63.5. So that buyer who's been making those payments for 240 months at, at the end of that term still owes $63,000 on their on their debt, which means that when we're paid off, our 240 months is paid off, the holder of the paper, the seller of the note actually gets it back with a balance of 63.5. So their total return is my 73.5 plus the 63.5 balance that they're going to get when they get the note back, their total return is $137,000. And if you look at that, if the buyer paid off the note today, they'd be paying off just short of $128,000 wow. to pay off the note. So there's a $9,000 gain by, mm -hmm. by the, utilizing this strategy, which mm -hmm. is a 7% additional return, additional gain. So that's one of the advantages of this. Now, it gets even more extreme when you shorten the period that's sold. So as an example, if we sold a 15 year term, mm -hmm. um, my, yep. my price is gonna be 69.5. The balance remaining on the note is a lot higher. It's 87,000. The total return then to the note holder is 157,000. And again, if they pay off the note today, there's a $29,000 advantage by utilizing this strategy over if the note was paid off in full today. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third option is uh, even more dramatic. You can see the yields are dropping. My yield is about 9% on these second and third options. It's primarily because the term is shorter. I don't need to make as much on a shorter term than I would if I was buying 345 payments. So uh, let's, let me reword it for some people who may not fully understand, right? But you laid out perfectly. When they say the balance, Right after 240 months in that scenario, option one, 
once I'm done getting my 240 months of payments of that monthly payment, right? That uh, 779.42, that loan goes back for, goes from me back to you, the seller, and you still get to collect the remaining 105 payments, which at that time when we send it back to you, the balance of the note is $63,000. Yeah. So you're still going to collect another $63,000 plus interest for the 105 payments moving forward, which that's awesome, right? And I got my yield, you got your some money out of it, and you can move forward to it. Um, so if this was something that you were holding in your IRA, this is a perfect yeah. uh, strategy because then you've got that, you've got income, whatever it is, 10 years from now, five years from now, 15 years from now, whatever it is, uh, plus a lump sum today. So a lump sum today, after some time goes by, once that partial is completed, you still get that income back into your IRA. <clears throat> so it's a it's a great strategy for an IRA. It's actually a win-win for everybody because the holder of the paper is actually when they sell X number of months of payments, they're mm -hmm. actually retaining a portion of the interest that they wrote on that note. That's why the yields or that's why the returns are are higher, is because they're still getting interest. And that's the beauty of it. The balance doesn't drop to zero at the end of 240 months on their note. It, it drops to whatever the remaining balance is, and then they take it over. So the advantage really is very strong. It, it's a win for the seller of the paper. It's a win for you as a buyer of the paper. Uh, for you, you mentioned, Nathan, the IRAs. Uh, it's a great strategy for IRAs, for long-term investment strategies there. Uh, it, it really is... Um, Everybody benefits on a transaction yeah. like this. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, as you can see, the entire note, I can only pay eighty-one thousand dollars. This is all about time value money. It's a financial calculator. Now, someone that in the chat asked me about it. Um, this is a financial calculator, right? And it's just because we're ch changing the number of months, right? We're reducing the number of months, and we're fact that we're setting the 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 rate we're looking for to be exactly right. This all makes sense if you're original interest rates at 10 and we look for 12 the numbers come come together um we have a great chart to kind of give you an idea of what that looked like i'll put that in the uh chat so people can see it and it really comes together to show you the fact that this is a great option for people who are looking for an idea of how much money can i get for a note that makes sense to you me and everyone else but you get some money out of it I get a great return, right? And it's only for a short period of time or a long period of time. You have 120 months. I've done a two-year partial. I've done a 60-month partial. I've done a 12-year partial. And this idea is amazing for both note sellers and note buyers. And a lot of note buyers out there are hungry for this. So you note originators, if you can do more of this, you're going to get a lot of money coming your way. And as long as you have the nice the ability to do this, It'll a home run every single time you do it. Yeah. One of the other benefits of this is the amount of money you need to play in this arena as a buyer of paper. Yes. Shrinks. You don't need as much. I mean, yes. the whole note's 81000 to buy 10 years is only 54000 So yeah. you, you get to reduce the amount of capital that you have to invest in any one given note and you can spread your capital among multiple notes that way, rather than putting it all into one transaction. So it gives that strength as well to the note buyer uh, or the partial note buyer of uh, of expanding their their market, their opportunities. Yeah. So Mark, when you've told us, what is the biggest hurdle most of these seller originators and so that struggle with this concept? What what are some of the questions or pushback you've gotten on this? Well, the first, the big question is, uh, what happens if the buyer pays off early? Mm -hmm. That comes into play. And then the second question is, what happens if they don't make the payments? And I have, and there's a foreclosure. So those are usually the two key elements that have to that have to be addressed. Um, when we do a transaction like this, we create an alternative uh, alternative amortization schedule. And that amortization schedule shows what our involvement is for the period of time that we have that note. And it shows what the balance is at any given moment of that time. So we may buy uh, 15, let's say 15 years of option two. Yep. Uh, 
And five years into the deal, the buyer pays off. Mm -hmm. So uh, we we would look at our amortization, our fifteen year amortization, see what our what the balance is based upon what we bought the note for, sure. and um, and then we just pick that balance, and that's what our return would be. We would collect that amount of money, and the seller of the paper would get the rest. So they get the benefit of of that that shortened amortization or that minimal amortization, because I'm again we're only buying. $69,000 of a balance of 128,000. We're only buying, you know, half of it. So we're only entitled to half the payoff in a sense uh, when, when the note pays off in full. So that's what happens with a early payoff. Same strategy occurs if there's a default. If there's a default situation, we're gonna say to the holder, to the original holder of the paper, look, we, we need to collect our balance you can come in and pay us off that balance and then you can take back over the note and foreclose. And a lot of times that note originator knows the borrower, right? And it's like, listen, I'll take over and get it performing. And would you buy it back? Sure, right? It, no skin off our back. Like, usually you can get that done because you know the borrower. Us, no partial buyers, we don't know the borrower. So it's a little bit different. So I ran some quick numbers. If you guys want to know if we bought this thing at a 10 interest rate, which is the yield number, and the same payment number, and for 24 months, really short one, it'd be 16,890.70, right? Which is dramatically lower. So no buyers who may have 15 grand in their Roth IRA or whatever can definitely fund these deals. So it depends on how much money you want out, right? If you're looking at, hey, listen, I need to pull 50 grand out of this. We can back into it and say, okay, fine. How many months can we buy to equal to 50,000. And we can work numbers all over the place as long as it works for us for our returns and for you guys. And we would take ownership over. You would stay on the servicing side of it. We both work with our servicer to make sure that you can dial in any time to see where things are at. And we turn around and say, great, this works for you. Right. So you guys service loans? Sorry. I'm do you sorry. guys service loans as well? No, we don't. Okay. We, don't, we we have a third party servicer handle it. It's uh, okay. it makes life a lot easier when you have that independence that way. Yes. Absolutely. And yep. and plus it converts back to the seller the paper easier. You know, if if we're yes. we're not collecting those payments, if somebody else is, it's a simple matter of signing a an assignment yep. back and it's done. And we yeah. encourage you those who are creating notes, please use a servicer when you create a note for payment. It's like a property manager. Um, it's crucial in our space to do that for multiple reasons. Monthly statement going out, the end of the year tax, paperwork, all that stuff most originators are not doing, and you need to start doing it. But right. So when people do this, you know, there's an amortization schedule that shows if we, I'm going to ask a dumb question here, a softball question. In the beginning of an amortization schedule, what gets paid more, the interest or the principal? Well, that's the interest. That's a softball right. for sure, David. Yeah. Uh, yeah it's all so there's a ton of UPB left at 15 years or 20 years or five years after. That's a ton of money to collect that when this thing pays off, all we're doing is really collecting the, the beginning interest and you're collecting all the money in the back end, which is awesome. So we encourage you guys to think about the strategy. But again, we would rather do this with a loan that, that either there's no first or this is the first or that the wrap, uh, the partial purchase would pay off that underlying first um, to make it cleaner, easier, and more uh, attractive. And for you guys who are doing this, you can, if you're doing 80 20 loans that some of the bigger players are suggesting, you could do this with both of them or one of them or, you know, at any time. And you can sell a partial, then sell another partial after that was done, and do another partial after that one's done all along the way. You'd one actually thing, make more money that way as yes. a seller. Yeah. One of the things we've been seeing lately is we've got a, some transactions that are coming in where it's a it's a first and a second. So the seller is selling the property, carrying back a first and a second. And that first is at 70% loan to value. So the beauty of that is that we can then structure a transaction where we would buy a portion of that first or the whole first for that matter. But generally it's buying a portion of that first uh, and then the seller's profit picture really comes into play in that second. 
And so the advantage is they get cash, even with a low down payment buyer, they still get cash from the selling of the partial on the first, and they still retain that cash flow on the second and the profitability picture comes in on that second. So it really is a good strategy for real estate sellers that are selling to owner occupants or even non-owner occupants for that matter as well. Yeah. So I encourage you guys reach out to me, Nathan, if you are curious about this, not sure about it, we can run the numbers. We can jump on zoom even and run numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, We just ask that you have the note in hand. You're not brokering it. So we can literally go over that piece by piece and we can break it all down, right? As long as you're willing to work with us, um, the returns we're looking for may be a little higher than this, but your note's probably not a six. Your probably note's at an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And remember, the higher that interest rate, the easier it is for us to, to purchase uh, for that. Because that's really, your interest is your return. So, so yeah. Mark, when you do these kind of partial transactions and stuff like that, what I'm finding is that this is really a simple way just to cash the money out and still be in control on both the, the originator side and the buyer side. And we can do this as many times as we want. I find that most originators are just not aware of it. Is that what your biggest hurdle, I guess, not even teaching it, but just making them aware of it? Yeah, it's always a uh jaw dropping when I talk to a real estate agent who hasn't seen this strategy before and then they they realize how they can expand the opportunities to sell more property. In a market like this, when real estate is challenging to sell, when prices are high, interest rates are high, um, you try to come up with strategies that are going to make sales occur more often. And this is a strategy. And most agents are not taught this. Most agents have no clue about it. And I usually have a yeah. conference call with the agent and the seller uh, so that I can explain the strategy to them so that when they do have a buyer, mm-hmm. uh, that it, it, they can structure it in a proper fashion. It really works well, but it's a one-by-one educational process. It's a very slow education because it's just not mainstream. Most agents are used to selling with somebody getting conventional or FHA financing. Right. And that's- I'd be curious if you can post in the chat, even on YouTube with <clears throat> the comments, who would like to see us run these kind of deals live, right? And I have this deal and kind of do a, a Shark Tank kind of idea that, hey, I got this note. What do you guys think? What do you guys see? If you do, put in the comments and chat. And me and Nathan will discuss about having that option for you guys to really kind of narrow down and see scenarios. Because um, I think it's important to see the math. This is a great layout of what we're looking for um, and what we're seeing. But tell us what you're what you're trying to learn, what you're trying to do, and what you're doing. And do you have assets that you literally can do this with? Um, please let let us know about that. Uh, we'd love to hear about that opportunity for you. I'm seeing Heidi and Randy uh, on Facebook and in uh, LinkedIn. I see a couple more people there as well, uh, seeing some interest. So I definitely want to encourage you guys to stay in touch with us. We'll help you through this. Um, it is a win-win if we all can come through that um, and go from there. Uh, Marcus, you can reach out to me and Nathan. Um, you can hit us up in the chat or you can choose an email or uh, there's actually that uh, the beginning pinned uh, comments, a way to get a hold of Mark's information. And in that case, we'll, you'll get an email from both of us uh, that you can reach out to us. So I'll put that again in the comments here. So good question um, though. Their services are all over and there are a lot of great ones. So yeah, we're happy to hook you up with them. Yeah. So we're getting some <laughs> more questions in here. Um, what we go back to, if we need to go back, this is fine. Let's go back and uh, kill the share and just talk for a few minutes and answer some questions here. Awesome. Um, <laughs> Heidi made the comment. Uh, if I would have seen this, I could have sold my last note, uh, I guess last whole seller finance because I owned it outright beneath the cash. Oh, oh, yes. You don't have to sell the whole note now for you know. it to work. Oh, <laughs> it's okay. Heidi, we encourage you. Let's make some more notes with you. Let's get you some more cash in your pocket and let mm-hmm. you can con- continue. Um, so um, Marcus asked, how can you locate services? 
Um, if you're looking for us, you can reach out to us through our, our pages and groups and all that stuff. Um, we both run some great stuff. Um, you sure, I'm sure you can find us on our websites. Um, and if you're looking for uh, our, our boy Mark here, um, you can go right to the link, click on it, and you'll get his information. Um, but he's a wealth of knowledge. If you haven't used an RMLO before, you need to start doing it. Um, please do that. Um, Heidi, yeah, please feel free to reach out to us. We'll definitely jump on a call with you to kind of walk through this. Um, if you want, send us a message or PM, whatever, and we'll go from there. So um, one thing I want to mention yeah. for those who have not used an RMLO yet, uh, here's one of the cool things you can do. So, and servicer, by the way, uh, you can have the borrower pay for it. So oh, it, yes. it's relatively inexpensive to begin with. Uh, however, uh, that can be a charge placed on the borrower where the buyer, borrower, whatever you want to call them, the person buying the house, they can be the ones that pay for that. And that's part of their, um, you know, processing fee, whatever you want to call it, uh, just to be able to enter into a loan with you. You can also write into your loan that the borrower will pay for servicer cost. Yes. Servicing, again, is relatively inexpensive. Typically, it's a flat fee. Yep. You're talking maybe $30 a month kind of thing. Like, it's really not expensive. But again, you can have the borrower pay for that. I wouldn't put a number in that. I would just pay that they are going to pay for servicing. Um, and leave it open. And that allows servicing. us to actually buy it for a higher amount because yes. we don't have to, when we buy a note that's 779, we have to duck 30 bucks for servicing because right. that won't come to us, right? And make sure you focus on the P&I, the principal and interest, yes. not the PITI because the P, the tax insurance don't come to us. We're focused on just the P&I payment. Yeah. Um, we're getting some good questions here. Um, keep them coming. Um, so one of the questions about there in Illinois, uh, is this a great state for solar financing? I, I hate to say it's not, but it's really not. It, um, it's especially outside of Cook County, yeah. you're going to do much better. In in Cook County, you're going to have a hard time finding buyers for those notes. Outside of Cook County, better, yes. uh, but Illinois is a tough state. So just be sure to, I know a lot of the seller finance people either don't talk about this or just not aware of it. There are debt license collection license you need to have in certain mm -hmm. states. And Illinois is one of the states that requires you to have a debt license a bond. So I would encourage you to explore more about that. We're not attorneys, um, but we definitely would like to uh, make sure you're focused on that. Um, yeah. So Heidi made the comment too. This is the perfect option. So they don't have to ask for a down payment when selling a house. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um if we can sell, solve that problem, we would love to be able to do that for you. Um, and getting an information is key. So what we want you to do, this is the game plan we're putting forth. I want you to go get in a house, find that borrower, right? This is a technique that uh, our, our buddy Dan Diaz um, didn't know about, this whole partial world. He's done hundreds, not thousands of owner finance notes. Get your borrower in place. Reach out to Mark. Get mm -hmm. him to underwrite that loan. Make sure the borrower has the ability to repay and everything is clean. Have the documentation. Get the loan. You can get down payment. I encourage you to still get that down payment, right? Reduce your basis. Reach out to us and say, listen, I need 40 grand to go do this. How many payments will you do for 40 grand? And we'll give you a number, right? We'll write it up. We'll have a servicer do it. We'll have an attorney. Well, if you need escrow, we'll do that. And we'll keep going over and over again. And we'll cash you out as much as we possibly can. And we have plenty of capital to do this with. We just want to basically be in a position of the no buyer and let you do what you do as best you can. We're, we're the laziest investors you'll meet. We just want to <laughs> buy a stream of payments. That's it. <laughs> I, I don't see Bank of America going down there hustling, right? <laughs> No, exactly. Wells Fargo is not hustling. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just like them. We like our computer seats. We like being close to our fridge, all that good yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. But we have the capital to do this kind of stuff. Um, we encourage you to, to go through Mark and let him know, I'm looking to sell this note, right? Or there's plenty of other ones too. Mark's not the only one, but he's a nationwide with tons of knowledge. So I would start with Mark. So then Mark can kind of lead you in the right direction. Right. If you have a weird scenario, he can refer you if he needs to. But more than likely, he can write for all 50 states without any problems. Right. So, Mark, everything we've said here, you've had years and decades of years of experience. 
Is anything we're saying here incorrect? I know we've been probably talking for a couple months now. Is anything here that we're maybe misguiding people on or from what you've seen in your experience? No, the only the only caveat I'd be a little careful of was what Nathan said. You can have the, the buyer pay the fee, the RMLO fee. You have to be a little yes. careful there because yeah. <clears throat> most states have a licensing law. And that licensing law prohibits anybody from collecting a fee without being licensed. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if the seller tries to collect that fee, that can be problematic. But if the if the buyer is paying the fee directly, then you don't have that issue. The other okay. thing is that the RMLO requirement is for sellers. It's not for buyers. Buyers are not required to hire somebody to do this process. Sellers are the ones that are required. So anytime you have an RMLO engaged in that process, they're going to be, um, their their client is the seller, not the buyer. So they, they're they obligated to fulfill the report based upon what the seller tells us gotcha. is, is the nature okay. of it. So that obligation is the seller's obligation to pay that fee. They can pass it on however they can figure out a way to pass it on. But it's really the relationship is between the RMLO and the seller. That's where gotcha. the that's where the yeah. client relationship is. Yeah. Thanks so see, um, Randy made a comment that he's in the process of uh, buying a finance deal, just closed the subject two and about to execute a strategy with a wrap. Um, can you create a note prior to closing with the end buyer? Uh, and how long do you need the seasoning before uh, we can buy the note? Um, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. I'm not uh, sure how you'd create a note before. So again, you're creating a note yeah. with the borrower, that wrap borrower in that position, the notes between you and them. The agreement between you and I is I'm buying a part of that note, right? I'm not, we're not creating a new note. I'm not giving you a loan. In this case, I'm working with a partial. I'm buying a part of that note you just created. But that makes sense. And we're, now, if this is a land contract or deed of trust or a mortgage, that may change our return number. But in the case of we're going to buy a part of it, just like you sold that entire note to us. In this case, you're not selling the entire 360 months. You're only selling 60 months, 24 months, 180 months. You're bu we're buying a part of that future payment and it reverts back to you. Um, there's an assignment of mortgage and all that stuff that goes inside of that. Mm -hmm. um, for the second question, Nathan, I'll let you answer this. How long do you need? What seasoning do you need? And I know Mark argued with us on a private call about this, right? Um, how long do you need to buy a note for seasoning? So um, I'm personally, I'm more interested in buying a whole note. And if you've gone through an RMLO and it's gone through the proper underwriting, I'll buy it. I'll table fund that. I'll, I'll buy that right away. Uh, my, my thinking on that, my reasoning on that is if you've just qualified this borrower, then that's good enough. You know, if they're <laughs> brand new and they're, and they've just been qualified, then they're qualified in my mind. Uh, so I'll buy that right away. I don't need any seasoning. Mark, Dave, you, you want some seasoning on that, right? I want a month or so just to make sure the borrower, even though their ability to pay is, they actually will have the motivation. Um, Mark, is there any concerns with us buying a note table funded? Is there any kind of rules or laws to get that with Dodd-Frank at all? Or No, there's no restriction. But the reality is, you know, when a mortgage company makes a brand new home loan, they don't have a seasoning history uh, on how they made those payments. It's a, it's from day one, there's a brand new loan being made and they'll sure. fund that loan based upon the underwriting criteria. Sure. And that's my attitude as well. And similar to Nathan's in, in that respect is that if it's, if I can do the underwriting and I feel confident with the buyer being, being able to make the payments, I don't need seasoning. There's a, there's sure. a tradition in this industry that seasoning is a key component to it. Yeah. And, you know, they can get run over by a truck tomorrow. It has nothing to do with, you're right. The, the seasoning, how they've done in the past. So I prefer looking at it from the perspective of underwriting today. What do they look like today? And do I think that they're going to make the payments based upon the RMLO? That's kind of how I look at, at, at the paper. Yeah. And one other thing that goes along with that as well is it's not unusual for payments to drop off when there's a change of servicer. So if somebody's been making payments to whoever, one servicing company for the last six months, 
and now all of a sudden they're changing. I, it can just be a little bit confusing. It can put people off and then payments can get missed. Uh, and we've seen that, Dave, you've seen that. We've seen that over the years. Yep. So again, my reasoning is if I can be the first servicer and the only servicer that they're dealing with, then great. Uh, and not me personally, obviously, I, I use a third-party servicer. But if their first payment can go straight to my servicer so that that's what they're used to and that's what they're they're habituated to do is just continue to pay that one servicer. That's another reason why I'll, I'll table fund that guy. So Randy asked the last question. Uh, Dodd-Frank only allows you to do three seller finance transactions in a calendar year. Is that correct, Mark? No, no, it's not. It's the three rule, the three loan or three transaction rule applies to when you have to hire a loan originator. If you're doing three or more in a given year, then you have to hire a loan originator for the, for the owner occupied transactions. Um, that's where that three, three transaction rule comes into play. If you're doing less than three in a given 12 month period, and it's not by the way, a calendar year, it's a 12 month, 12 month count a 12 month period, then mm -hmm. you may not have to hire a loan originator. So if you're only, if you're one offs, you know, that type of thing, if you've just got a, a seller who's got one property he's selling and carrying back and he's not an investor of any sort. You don't really need the loan originator. I have people that still hire me to do it just because they want to know that they have confidence in the buyer to be able to perform. But it's not a requirement where Dodd-Frank does require three or more. In a but they time. still need to make sure that borrower has the ability to repay. They can't just say, give me a checkbook and boom. They need to make sure that the ability, that borrower's ability to pay. Is that correct? Well, they should. They don't have to hire a loan originator to make that determination, though. Gotcha. That's the, that's a distinction. Is that the three property rule, three transaction rule, is where I mentioned earlier. That's the loan originator employment act. I mean, that's where we get paid <clears throat> when it yeah. happens for three yeah. or more. But but less than three, uh, if it's one offs every once in a while, you, you just don't have the 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 requirement under Dodd Frank to hire anybody. And, awesome. and Jeff Watson is working to put you out of business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Change that to 24 and a 12 one. Right? Yeah. You oh, know, is that right? Is that, yeah. I didn't hear that. He's, yeah, yeah. Well, Jeff Watson, we had him on a few months ago. He's trying to push 24, but even with 24, you still want someone to kind of look over the numbers. Right? I would. <clears throat> yeah. 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 I would it's still just, want to have a, just, a third party look at it's that. It's just a strategy. It's a good strategy to make sure somebody else is looking over your shoulder. That's really yeah. what it boils down to. Again, yeah. it makes it more valuable when you're going to resell it. So a third party, check this out. Yes, they're yep. qualified. And us dope buyers want to see that too, right? I don't want to see the fact that, well, I ran numbers, right? What'd you run, right? I want to make sure that someone qualified that that borrower to make me feel more comfortable that that borrower is going to perform. Not someone said, hey, listen, I met one at a diner. And they had a checkbook and they wrote me a deposit of 10 grand. That doesn't that doesn't track me at all. It's not a deal. It actually actually reverses it. I I, I kind of want to run from that deal. So make sure you do it right so that you have options when you need to get cash. Yeah. All right, Mark. So we're we'll wrap up here, but we're we're always curious to hear from our guests about where you think we're headed. Um, we're telling talking a lot about seller finance. So let's let's go in that direction. Where do you see seller finance going here in the future? What's your crystal ball? It just seems to me that when you've got high interest rate cycle like we have going on and, and high prices, seller carry back has traditionally been much more attractive. Uh, it allows a buyer to get in without having to jump through all the hoops and it allows the seller to sell the property and, and create that revenue stream. So for me, uh, and it, if you look back at cycles when we've seen high interest rate or high inflation cycles, Seller carryback is is very common, um, kind of rears its head and becomes much more of a prominent player in those types of uh, economies. So I suspect that's what we're looking at in the in the near term. It seems like until rates drop significantly, I think that's what you're going to see. Wow. What's what's your rate drop prediction? Any thoughts on that? Oh boy, that's <laughs> if I had a crystal ball, I wouldn't be talking to you guys right now. I'd be at the <laughs> eighty or something. Um, you know, it just, it's hard to say, uh, you yes. know, it's, um, I read something yesterday that uh, 80 some percent of, of panelists, experts think that rates are going to stay the same or go up. So 
that kind of gives you a perspective. We okay. read recently that the what the credit card debt in America is like 1.3 billion or trillion. Trillion, it's, I think. It's yeah. highest ever. Yeah. So these borrowers are putting a lot of money. So those people who are doing owner finance, just be aware of that. That yes, things have been good for the last three to four years. That things have been performing great, which me, Nathan, as you probably could see, we're in the space of buying performing notes, which was very rare 10 years ago, even five mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. um, just be careful of that because if that hits, your portfolio may drop dramatically. So that's the scary part about this. Yeah. So just be aware of that. So, well, uh, Mark, uh, hold on for a minute. We're going to let the uh, public go and we'll recap with you. And uh, I appreciate you joining us on this Friday afternoon and sharing your wealth and knowledge. Well, thanks. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you guys. Fantastic. Thanks so much.